Right, we'll just get started. Uh, welcome to the scrutiny meeting under these rather uh, difficult circumstances. It's good to see you all. I think I can see everyone, which is a, an advantage in itself. Uh, we're going to apologies for the meeting. I understand that Councillor Coleman has offered his apologies. Any other apologies that we're aware of? No, I don't think so. Right. Declarations of interest. Anyone wish to say anything under declaration of interest? No. Going on to item three, the minute of the last meeting, which unfortunately I wasn't able to attend. It's a very fulsome minute, and uh, um, it, it, from the point of view of, of scrutiny, I think it's an excellent uh, minute to have this in the to the degree that it's it's there. Anyone wish to make any comments regarding the minute as tabled? Just to agree that that's a, an accurate record, convener. Thank you, Alison. Thank you very much. We'll go straight on then to um, item four, the rolling action log. Um, anyone wish to read anything under under this? Um, apart from the AS, the antisocial behaviour, I think things are obviously being carried forward uh, to, to, to our future meeting. Uh, and um, with from that point of view, any comments regarding the rolling action log? If not, we're going to sit on to item five. And item five, of course, is indeed uh, open to all members. Uh, and uh, I understand that uh, uh, Councillor Spears has joined us for this. Uh, Robert, I, I, I picked up that you had some problems with the, the, the sound. If at any time you've got, you wish to, to, to come in and are not getting recognised, just shout out as, as usual, please, and uh, we'll pay attention to that. Uh, and uh, the, the, I understand that this has been taken by, uh, 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 by, by Kenny Gillespie. Kenny, I'm going to ask you, invite you to speak to the, the paper, please. Convener, thank you very much. Uh, so, as, as always, Convener, I'm not proposing to go through the report in detail because I appreciate that members have read the report in full and will be certainly ready with some of their questions. So, I'm going to look at some of the salient points of the report and uh, hopefully uh, capture these to allow members to focus uh, and ready for their questions. Part one of the uh, report uh, outlines the purpose, and I think just for Today's meeting it outlines that uh, the report provides a performance information on people, communities, priority of the corporate plan. The new corporate plan was agreed in September uh, 30th, 2020, and covers 2020 to 2022, which was approved. Within section three of the report, it provides a bit of background and it, it outlines our community priorities, which is enable communities, poverty inequalities education, social care, and where we live. As I outlined earlier, a, a new plan was approved on the 30th of September this year. And uh, one of the, the, the things that we are uh, making strides to do is to report as one council against the plan. The priorities to deliver, to deliver this will be in two ways. Through business as usual, that is focused on enabling people and communities but also through the Council of Future Change Programme that will help business as usual adapt. Section four of the report provides an update, a very detailed update of the 10 activities within the community priority. And as I said, I'm aware that uh, members uh, will have read that. I'm not going to go through these in detail. However, as I said before, there's a wide range of activities to support people and their communities within our services, with our partners and with our community partners. I think also, Convener, we will focus on working with our communities to move some of these uh, examples highlighted from the change programme to, to the business as usual categories over the next few years. But we recognise this will require some big changes to the way that we work. The Council Future Programme is putting support in place to help with that, and will provide updates at future scrutiny meetings on communities, along with appropriate performance and information. 
I think it's safe to say that officers are proud of what we've achieved already and that we've worked hard to ensure that we don't lose what we gained through the pandemic in terms of our learning and our relationships with our community. Our continued challenge is to make sure that we implement our one council approach. Convener, if I could take back to section two of the report, which outlines our recommendations for the scrutiny committee, which is consider the performance of the council against the priorities of the committees within the corporate plan. As always, convener, I'm happy to take any questions, but I'm really pleased to say that there's a lot of other officers on the line today who will be better equipped to take these questions, and they're really looking forward to answering the questions that are asked by members. And if they could put their hand up or the correct way for committee today to answer them, that would help yourselves, convener. If they can't answer them, I'm happy to take them offline and come back to the individual members myself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kenny. Um, the uh, you, remarkably brief uh, on the, 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 the agenda, um, considering the fact that it takes a full cook's tour of the Council's activities, um, uh, I, I'm sure we can anticipate a, a lot of questions, um, and I, I would just simply like to throw it open to to members to uh, to, to to go and direct the questions, uh, either in general or to any officer if they wish to specify. Who am I? Uh, thank you, David. Uh, sorry. David thank you, Ryan, David Balfour. David, all right, aye. Um, yeah, just uh, page twenty. Um, <clears throat> it's it states there. I know it's no absolutely what it means, but it says safeguard their green spaces. Um, what I'm wondering is, we used to have a community safety team who would deal with areas that were outside um, the housing remit. Um, recently, we had a, an issue in Grangemouth where memorial trees were ripped out and burnt in one of the parks. Um, and as it turns out, we have no community safety team or enforcement officers to cover these areas. Can you explain why that's the case and what can we do to fix that? There was a lot of uh, damage done and a lot of very, very unhappy people um, in the community because of this. And it just seems that we've got nobody to turn to now to cover these areas uh, for vandalism or anything like that. Um, David, would you? Uh, sorry, D uh, Douglas, would you take that question, or someone who would like to volunteer to answer that one? Douglas, I'll, I'll pick that up, Councillor. Um, yeah, I mean, the community safety team has been the subject of, of some change in recent years, and working with colleagues in housing, and we have a arranged transfer of some staff into housing to allow a focus on, on uh, neighbourhoods uh, that relate to their uh, service and the, the uh, accommodation that they provide, the estates that they, they manage there. Um, but there have, have been savings in that team, a, re a reduction in service that uh, had to take place as a, as a consequence. But we do maintain a level of service for enforcement purposes. and. In fact, the enforcement officers were out and did note uh, the damage that had occurred in the in the park and referred that on to the police uh, for them to take action. So um, we do maintain a level of service, but not to the uh, the level that has been able to be offered in the past due to the uh, savings that had to be affected. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I've asked for extra patrols in the park. Um, and I was led to believe they would be carried out. However, uh, I've been told since that they don't cover vandalism. So unless it's dog fouling or litter, then they, they just don't do it. So what I was told was if it just happens to be an officer um, doing a patrol in a housing area and happens to look across into the park, then they would phone the police or contact the police. Yeah. Um, that's not really acceptable at all. We need, we had a good service before with the community safety team, and now we don't have that. We need some form of um, help if there is issues in areas that are not housing, and we just don't have it. So we need to have a look at that. There's, there's definitely a, a big change in the service there, and we need that sorted. Kenny, you want to come back in on that? 
Yeah, j just to uh, come back on uh, the issues that uh, Douglas was saying there. Doug Douglas is right, there had to be some hard decisions made uh, previously about this team. But just to, to reassure members and coming back uh, and hopefully supporting uh, Councillor Bell for a small bit, there is the community teams within the housing, and uh, it's not that the, the housing teams when they're out will ignore it. You're absolutely right. If they see things, they will pick them up, they will deal with it. And there is times where, yes, we will have a bit of flexibility, and uh, regardless if it's on the housing account or not, we will target some of these areas for a short time to try and help support our colleagues and their communities. But uh, taking on board what you've said, Councillor Balfour, in regards to the other aspects of the service, but I think uh, Douglas has, has outlined that. But certainly, if there's specifics and it's on, we'll work with our community partners, the police, and others to help resolve as much as we can. Thank you, um, Councillor Grant. You were wanting to get in. Come in. Do you hear me, David? Have, have you got me? Yes, we hear right, you, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, I was just saying, Mr Gillespie, that was a, a quick run, run down in this, this report. Um, thank you for that. Um, just a couple of points. I think this one is to, to, to Kenny. Um, on page 1541, at the bottom it says, um, additional, the, the vision has improved accommodation for young people leaving care using grant funding through the strategic housing investment. Kenny, could you explain that to me, what that actually actually means, please? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I've also got a colleague, Natalie Moore Young, who heads up that team as well, is there. But uh, yes, this is where uh, we've looked at uh, leaving care, where we can support individuals. And members may be aware that we refurbished our property uh, within what the council area to support this. And this was very much a strategy where we realised that instead of when somebody gets a property, that we just put them into that uh, property without the required support. And basically, depending on what their lifestyle has been or their background, youngsters do need support. So we, we have done that. We have got a purpose-built uh, property or we've renovated one to support that. We have the correct staff in place that brings potential lifestyle, uh, life skills, but also a feeling that there is somebody still there. So, for instance, when somebody would just move directly into a house, they were basically left there without support mechanisms. How do you get electricity? How do you deal with uh, your money, support? How do you keep continuing the good work that you may have been doing and staying away from undesirable? So, this is the area that we're focused on. It is something that colleagues within Children's Services and ourselves are looking at further to expand that scheme because it's one way that we certainly see going forward will support our leaving care. It also ties into the housing rapid rehousing plan and our housing first model, where at the first point of contact, it's not just about giving somebody a set of keys, it's getting to know the individual better and to establish if there's any support needs there that we can start right at the first point of contact and not wait till things potentially spiral out of control, Councillor. Thank you. Lorna, you want to come in? Um, John, could I come back oh, in on that, please? My, of course, my problem. Um, Kenny, um, final explanation. Does that tie in with, with page 19? Um, to ensure children and young people thrive in their education and training where evictions can't be avoided, then they'll go into the home seekers. Does that tie in? It, it ties very much in with working with our colleagues in children's services, where before it would need to be the absolute last resort for us to look at any eviction where children are involved, and it would need to come to uh, myself to actually sign that off, but I would work with colleagues and children's services with that because that is something that ourselves and uh, our colleagues and children's services have changed over the last two or three years to support part of what's been said in the plan, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kenny. Robert, do you wish to make any comment on that one? Uh, Mr. Uh, Robert, just, just, just to say, um, 
what what Kenny's outlined in in terms of the the dedicated building that was converted. Um, my understanding is that we've got something of the order of eight young people in in the flats that have been created, um, and there is a dedicated service to support these young people with with a common area um, for the young people to gather. And as Kenny says, the intention is there that young people get the opportunity to manage their first their first tenancy with a bit of support. Uh, there's people on hand if there's any issues that emerge for them day to day. Um, and the plan is that after a period, it might be six months, it might be longer, um, once they develop the necessary life skills, they can then move on into their own tenancy potentially elsewhere. Um, and the idea is that we've got a, a start point for for young people to gather and develop the experience that they need to support a tenancy and then move on through that. And it's been a tremendous success uh, so far. Thank you. David, do you want to come back in, Mr. Thrall? Is, is that, that the flats you're talking about there, Mr. Neil? Is that, is that Gary House? Yeah, it's got Gary Place, and as Kenny Gary says, as, as, as Kenny says, we are we are exploring the possibility of of doing that else, elsewhere as well. So what what we did was got that place open now a little over a year ago. Um, it's been working very well, and because we've we've demonstrated that it's a successful model, um, we're looking to see if there's any other uh, locales in uh, in the the authority where the same project could be. Could be de developed again to increase the capacity further. Thanks very much. I, I have actually visited it uh, um, myself and Councilman Bo went down and visited it. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks John. Lorna, where did you win? Don't hear you, Lorna. Yes. I've I've got three different questions on three different items in this report. Will I have to take them separately or come back in later and just start with one just now? Is well, that well, the best way? Try with one and see how we, how you like it. Right, okay, thank you. It's regarding the corporate plan communities. As much as I welcome this cut and red tape for communities to make decisions for themselves, I often find that our intentions are clear in the narrative. But what practical steps have we taken place to establish? And what measures can we put in place now, considering there's been very many community consultations and our officers work with their communities on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so, and obviously evidence has been given to me during the pandemic, you know, from communities, and I know the communities have worked very, very well, they've supported each other in the community, but a lot of them have said it's been difficult to connect to Falkirk Council during this time. So what, what they have said to me needs a more streamlined approach. And what we said was, if they've got a lot of questions or if they need a lot of support, they need a sort of one person to go to who can deal with all these inquiries. So do we have this in place at the moment? Is this something that we're looking to do in future? Kenny, I think you can pick up that one. Yep. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, Councillor, thank you very much for the question. Uh, as uh, members will be aware, a couple of weeks ago, an executive uh, enabled communities plan was passed by members, which outlines exactly what Councillor Binney was saying, is how we are going to connect with the communities. And it's very clearly laid out there in regards to the lessons learned from the pandemic, in regards to making sure that we use a lot more of our uh, third sector to get to the people who have what we call the quiet voice, make sure that we do listen to communities, because one of the things that we have uh, learnt, and we've learnt a lot, is actually very much the, the power of the communities and uh, what they, they can do. But at the same time, communities have learnt a lot, and it's been fed back to ourselves in regards to community leaders have even thought they had been dealing with all their communities until they actually got involved, more involved in the pandemic, and realised there was a lot more to their communities and the people within their communities than the ones that they were dealing with day in, day out. So that was a great learning process. Members also might be aware, and Councillor Benny might also be aware, we were privileged within Falkirk, our third sector, where that uh, Aileen Campbell, Cabinet Secretary for Communities, came and visited third sector on the back of 
the really good work that had been done and praised by our communities that were, and she's seen Falkirk in certain areas as an area of good practice and wants to make sure that we promote what we've done with our communities. So, yeah, on one hand, really good news. And if the councillors got specific areas in regards to the communities that felt that they were not being listened to, I'm happy to take that off piece, councillor, because that surprises me on the back of, as I said, a lot of the good work has been done. And with the visit from the Cabinet Secretary, putting Falkirk up there and certainly some areas in good practice. What I will also say is we are just about to embark on the Falkirk plan. And we're hoping that that will come out. Uh, it will start in the next two to three weeks where we'll look to involve communities, which will be done differently. But again, that's set out in the plan that, uh, sorry, in the paper enable communities. And the appendix to that report was the community choices paper that was agreed by executive a couple of weeks ago and it's laid out. And I'm happy uh, to, to send a, a report, uh, a copy of that to Councillor Benny Convener. Thank you. Lona, would you come back in? I can't hear you, Lorna. You're muted. Oh, that's him. With regard to that, Kenny, though, with regard to red tape, what is the community says to you that red tape is actually? Has it been communication? Has it been paperwork? Uh, has, has, that, has that been identified, as a matter of fact? Yeah. yeah. So one of the things about red tape was actually knowing who to go to because one of the things, and apologies, I'll refer back to the Enable Communities report because these were things that we did pick up because we listened to our communities, tying back to what you said, was, was very much they wanted one point of contact, they wanted a one approach, and that certainly laid out within that report of how we're going to do that and making sure one of the things uh, going forward, and as part of the corporate, corporate plan as outlined, is about the one council approach, and certainly through uh, the... It's now called the Communities Work Stream. It was called the Enable Communities Work Stream before. As we have a performer in place now, when any service or teams go out to do any consultation or any tying up with communities, we have a format that we need to go through to make sure that our communities don't get tired of consultation, of engagement, because you're absolutely right, they can, but also directs who the correct person is at point of source so that people are not getting put to pillar of post. But that was certainly recognised, Councillor Binney, and uh, welcomed that we have put something in place to do that. And that was through our uh, discussion with the communities that we've done that. Thank you. I have I have another point. Uh, can I bring this forward just now? You go, Lana, you're on a go. OK. Um, I welcome the switch to digital uh, MEX and CCTV. How, considering, considering the current pandemic, do we have enough resources in this area to progress these initiatives urgently? Can you agree this would have been more helpful and beneficial if these initiatives had been brought forward um, and that they would have been more beneficial during times of isolation for our elderly and our shielding communities, and also with the rise of antisocial behaviour in some areas? The more flexible CCT digital to react to all the irrational behaviours that's happening at this present moment in time. And what are the of these initiatives? Can you tell me when the pilot will take place with people and how how many people will be involved to assess its effectiveness and when will we get results of that? You again, Kenny? Councillor, I've, I've not exactly got the whole details. I can, because it's so specific that the councillor asked, I'm happy to take that off and come back to the councillor on that if she doesn't mind. That's fine, Kenny. Thanks very much. Th thanks, councillor. Okay, I just acknowledge at this particular moment that, uh, that um, councillor Goldie and councillor Bowes have joined us, which is welcome, of course, to the meeting. Uh, 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 I'm not quite sure who is what you're trying to get Thanks lots of tears. Uh, right, yes, yes, on you go, Robert. It's on page 18, uh, build on new strengths created within our communities. I, I noticed you only mentioned uh, one area that has been covered at the moment. I think there should be a message comes out to the Council congratulating all the areas that have put a great deal of effort in. Um, of course, as you know, I'm 
been involved with the Let's Feed Grangemouth campaign uh, with the Kersey Bag Community Project in Grangemouth, at one time delivering 2,000 ready meals per week. Um, there seems to be um, some difficulty uh, back at the council level with coordinating help for funding and um, correlating the the amount of food that's going out and who it's going to, so there's no double up problems. Um, as you say, the red tape is enormous for people to for us to try and to help enable communities, um, especially at this very difficult time. And I think we should be putting a great deal more effort in obviously our local level experience. I have been there years. I have that lived in experience. We need to have a, some sort of uh, um, meeting where we can all come forward from our communities, bring forward the experience we've had over the last eight months, and certainly build on the strengths that have been created in that area, and we can move on. Uh, we've just had really bad news in Greensmouth regarding um, possible uh, influx, uh, no influx, but greater unemployment in the area. And with the furlough scheme being somewhat, some people get it, some people don't get payments for that. We really need to be seriously looking at how we can um, maintain our communities and certainly let's feed our communities. But I think we need to have a, some sort of a special meeting where we can get together and go through the positives and negatives that we've experienced up to date. Thank you, Councillor Spears. Um, you, you certainly highlight um, some some excellent work which can be uh, uh, overlooked and certainly can't be overlooked. Uh, uh, and uh, it's good to, 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 to bring that to your attention. Anyone wish to make a special comment on that particular uh, theme? Uh, Alison? Uh, uh, Councillor Black, Alison? I had actually, I, I was going to ask some questions about something else, but I would agree full heartedly with Councillor Spears. And I think that there was a lot of organisations throughout the district that really came together and, and did a lot of great work. And I think that mental health in terms of our communities is a huge issue going forward. And again, those community groups have got a great role to play in that and trying to keep people going when they're having to stay in the house, et cetera, and, and, and are quite vulnerable and don't see anybody. Uh, and I think that a, a meeting a, a, about that with elected members would be good because I think it is, uh, it is good that we all sing from the same hymn sheet going forward. Alison, we'll come back to you on your other points, but perhaps uh, anyone, Kenny, do you wish to make any comments on? on... Yeah. Yep, uh, Convener, thank you. Uh, take on board uh, the issues that Councillor Spears has said, and uh, just to give uh, members a bit of background, uh, every Thursday, and I appreciate partners of all agencies meet and discuss the ongoing issues, and we do have uh, things in place when we, uh, which we need to, where emergency supplies, food is, is required. We have due process to go through, and that ties back to Councillor Spears' red tape, and that's certainly something that we're looking at. I mentioned earlier about the Falkirk plan. Councillor Black uh, just raised there about mental well-being, and uh, that is one of the priorities that we'll be looking at. And it's probably fair to say, uh, convener, and apologies, I'm going to a wee plug here, that members will be getting correspondence from ourselves, uh, either later today or tomorrow, about going forward about the Falkirk plan, where it's exactly what members are seeing now. We're looking for members be, to be totally involved in that, as well as our communities to help take things forward. So there will be provision to take forward the views and make sure that we are capturing everything in our communities to support it going forward. Thank you. Um, Councillor Spears, I, I, I should, did, should I give you the opportunity to come back because uh, obviously um, you've raised a, 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 an extremely important uh, matter which we can't afford to let slip. Do you wish to come back in? I'm sorry, the, you, the sound's not very good, but we, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I, I think this is our main priority as, as um, a council at the moment that we see a community through this pandemic. 
the, we, we let feeder communities. Um, mental health is a, an enormous thing in the area, especially with senior citizens. Some of them have been trapped in their own home for a considerable amount of time. Uh, we, we need to see more about uh, what communities are more affected by COVID-19 than are not. So we can start opening up certain areas. I appreciate that as a government decision, a Scottish government decision. But we are now getting to the stage where people are um, increasingly isolated. I, I know with the people we've delivered to, we're the only people we see. Um, we desperately need to have a meeting as a council where we can uh, all bring forward um, the good and the bad that's happened and really chat, start getting more organised and chat a way forward because this could go on for some time. I mean, I could go on all day about it. Um, that's why we need to have some form of meeting where we see that monies that are coming in are evenly distributed, areas especially of special need are being covered, uh, child deprivation and child poverty is especially being looked at. And we need to get a, a joined up plan here where um, we know where food's going, where food's not going, if there's double deliveries. Every organisation needs to put in a list. Uh, I know it sounds a bit big brother, but we're getting to the stage where things are desperate. I, I know in Greensburg we've had to start selling furniture. Uh, we're not allowed to sell, but for the nations to buy food, things out there are extremely difficult in certain areas. And unless we come forward with a plan, one, recognising who's doing the work, and two, uh, making sure where, needs, uh, where the need is greatest, that's where need is open. Thank you, Robert. Um, I think we, we, we get that message. I hope we get that message. Uh, it certainly was very important. Um, I, I'm just not sure. Uh, Dennis, you you want to come in? Don't hear you, Dennis. No, you're muted. <laughs> No, can't hear you. You're still muted. Try now. Sorry. I think it's right. you're having problems with your, your microphone because you're off. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. Sorry. Can we give you a minute? And I think I, I promised Alison that uh, she would get back in. Okay, I think Mark had his hand up just in response to Councillor Spears' question to follow on. Sorry. Um, and then my, my uh, I'm getting distracted by that. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to, to overlook um, any follow ups from Robert's important points. Does any, any officers wish to? Mark, you want to come in? Thank you, Convener. Thanks very much for that. I think the points that Councillor Spears makes are really, really important, and it's something that, as officers, we are continually considering. As Kenny Gillespie stated earlier on, we meet regularly every Thursday between four o'clock and half past five to discuss the very points that Councillor Spears was raising. We now we're now going to meet on a twice weekly basis because obviously things seem to be worsening for for a lot of people, as Councillor Spears highlighted, and particularly in terms of financial insecurity. I'm certainly aware that the Scottish government is going to be allocating folk at council some money that has to be spent up to the 31st of March that begin that may well begin to address financial insecurity as well as food insecurity. And we do need to get into conversations with our communities and with elected members about the priorities for spend on that and also the mechanisms that we can as a council can can ensure that the, the, the food is being prioritised on the people who would most need it. And that also that we take a cash first approach so that people who 
are entitled to benefits and, and are, are actually maximising them as much as possible, as well as getting access to food that, 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 that tackles some of the food poverty that's existing within our communities. So we are really beginning to address that. I know there's been a lot of learning as we've moved through the pandemic, and we, we've really took that on board and tried to to, to give consideration to that. And it's not just as a council, we're, we're working really closely with our third sector partners, as well as importantly, the other public sector partners, that includes uh, the Integrated Joint Board, uh, Health and Social Care Partnership, and uh, Fourth Valley NHS to really develop a partnership approach to this, because it, it cannot be a one council approach that just resolves these situations. It's going to take a much more complex set of uh, responses, and, and that's what we're trying to develop. But we are trying to take the points that Councillor Spears has, has, has highlighted to us. We are trying to take them on board as much as possible. Thank you for that, uh, Mark. Um, now, where are we going from here? Um, uh, Alison, uh, I did say to, to come back to you. Thanks very much. I've got three things I just want to mention. And the first one is that if we're delivering on the community's priorities, then one of their priorities is the community warden team and feeling safe in their communities and especially going into the winter there's an awful lot of, in Grangewood there's a lot of flats but for example a lot of these blocks of flats the, the doors are not work the front doors are not working because the repairs are you know, behind there's a lot of issues with repairs getting done etc they're kind of behind so people are, are, are feeling kind of scared and the community warden team did a great job with that type of thing but they are stretched they are stretched now. They're not doing what they did before. There is a lot of issues with antisocial behaviour in the parks, etc. And people don't feel safe. And I think that because that's a big community priority, we need to look at that again. All right, it was a saving, but we need to look at that again because we need to make sure that the, the priorities of our delivering are the right ones for the people that we represent. So I think that's something we need to look at going forward as the community warden team and how I know it's been reconfigured a couple of times but maybe we need to look at that again. So the second thing I just want to say was that when we're looking at the cycle the cycle routes etc is that there are areas that have not had an awful lot of work done in that area. I'm thinking about an important one is Grangewood to Bones for just for one example and you know maybe we need to look at that and see where there is a lack uh, uh, where you know where where we need to go and put more infrastructure in that one, and the third thing I wanted to say was that there is a definitely a review needed to be done with, with regards to house and repairs because there are definitely issues with communication between departments between different sections of house and and I think that the customer service could definitely be improved. That's that, that's the three things I wanted to highlight. Thank you, Alison Douglas. You want to come? Can you come back on these points? In relation to the wardens, I, I made the point earlier about the change in the nature of the service that took place coinciding with the savings that uh, had to, to be enacted last year. So, you know, that is a change, a material change that has taken place. And obviously, our, our wardens, the wardens that we retain, are principally focused on enforcement relating to um, uh, environmental matters, waste. Uh, the litter fly tipping and um, where that, that focus has been making a difference, but definitely is a change in the pattern of, of service. Obviously, we do connect closely with um, Kerry's team in relation to the oper operations on, on uh, housing areas. Um, and Kenny may want to pick up a bit more detail on the point about the flats that was mentioned there. In relation to cycling, and um, we've been uh, bolstering the cycling infrastructure. We've been tapping into some of the, the various funds that are around uh, for the provision of that infrastructure, and um, including works that uh, have been taking place on the shore front at Bones. So we are keen to, to promote and do further there. Thank you. Um, Kenny, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, uh, I'll come back and if you don't mind convener on the repairs and that as well, if that's okay, I can, yeah. back can do that. Certainly, if it's the flats and uh, our community wardens, uh, certainly, as we mentioned, should be walking around these areas and we do target the flatted areas. So I'm hoping and I appreciate what you're saying, councillor, in regards to the service delivery, but that should be complemented by our housing teams as well. 
within the area because their housing teams are back out and their patches and are working. I'm not saying, and quite rightly, that everything in regards to repairs are uh, back to full uh, speed because there was a backlog to capture after the lockdown. But what I would say, if there's any issues about security, front doors and, and repairs in regards to housing uh, HRA properties, then that should be going through the correct priority through an emergency repair if it is classed as that. And it should be, if not, it should be then put forward and happy to take forward individual repairs. You did say uh, about the issues about looking at repairs and the connectivity between that and other services about repairs. I'm, I'm able to tell you that uh, David McGee, who heads up that team, is actually leading a redesign of housing repairs at the present time and looking at making sure that what we do is for, for purpose and seeing how we can streamline it going forward in the coming years. And again, that's driven by our uh, most recent pandemic and how we deal things. What we'll also say, some repairs are more difficult than others to do than now because of social distancing and because where we could put multiple change persons into properties to do a repair, we have to make sure that uh, where possible, or well, as always, sorry, social distancing have to adhere to, so we can't put as many trades in at one time to speed up the amount of repairs, which does then have a knock-on effect to repair time scales. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Dennis, uh, I, you've been trying to, to get in. Can you can you get in now? <laughs> um, uh, I'm sorry, Dennis, there's something wrong. I can't hear you. Dennis, it might be the, the volume on your laptop. See if you can turn the volume up on your laptop individually. There might be a section for the uh, input level for your microphone as well. Check that. No. Um. I I I I see um, Lorna David Balper and also Jim Blackwood. Jim, you have to I've been on to the interview very well then, hey, can you know? Sorry, I do apologise. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Kevin. I've got three, I've got three questions on the report. Uh, on page fifteen, uh, the area about uh, seventy-one frontline staff, housing staff, undertook awareness of uh, raising session, sessions on dementia. Could ask who delivered the training sessions. That could ask my colleague Natalie Moore Young to answer that. She she led that. Or she'll have a better idea than myself, convener. Councillor Blackwood, I'll confirm that and come back to you. Okay, thank you. On you go, Jim. The right, second one is on uh, page 16, and it's about the during the pandemic, the Go Youth Trust had a change of direction, and it appears to have been very successful. I'm just wondering if this approach will continue through Christmas and beyond lockdown mm -hmm. on this particular initiative. Looks like Matt, want to answer that question? Can someone pick that one up? Convener, I'll pick that up. With... Thank you. It's a really interesting point you make, Councillor Blackwood. And uh, yeah, what the Go Youth Trust had to do, and it's, it's like a lot of other youth work organisations within the council, is they had to pivot from doing obviously face to face work uh, prior to the pandemic hitting to doing more digital online work. And it was quite interesting the way they did it because they actually got young people involved in the design and delivery of the sessions and it looked really well in terms of the Facebook site, other things that they were using. And they got relatively high numbers. They didn't see a decline that much in terms of the people who were accessing the service. And uh, they were able to then plan with other 
partners, including schools and uh, ourselves, how they could resource some of the work that they wanted to do. So they applied to Cash for Kids and they were successful in getting grant funding that enabled them to do it. What they found has been that the, the, the digital work that they did initially had great results and they found that over the last number of weeks, the, the numbers of young people participating has dropped. But it's, and when they've been asking young people why that is, young people feel fatigued about being online all the time, believe it or not. They feel tired with it. They feel as though it's a, a challenge to them. And that Go Youth Trust have again had to pivot and they're now doing small group walks outside with the young people to provide the youth work opportunities that they've done. And they do intend to carry over the family-based work over the Christmas period as well. But that's also resource driven. As you can see, it can be quite costly to provide the vouchers, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But they're going to continue to do that. And to, just for information, the Go Youth Trust are working very closely with schools within children's services. And, you know, to be honest with you, there's, there's about eight different schools they're working with, three high schools and five primary schools they're working very closely with. And the schools themselves are working with Dave Bremen at Go Youth Trust to, to identify the families should really most benefit from the intervention that's been offered and to ensure that they're, 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 they're getting that in, in, in a purposeful way. And the families actually have are able to negotiate with Dave Bremner and Go You Trust and the volunteers there that uh, how that can be delivered best to suit their needs. So they, they, they will be carrying it over. Going back to the crux of the question, they will be carrying it over the Christmas months, you know, Christmas festive period. Yes, they will be. Yeah. Thanks for that, Mark. And obviously, I, I find it hard to believe that youngsters are tired of being online or it's maybe just sex boxes they like playing with. Well, that could be, you could be right there, Councillor Blackwood, yeah, you could be. Yeah. Well, my third question is, is uh, on page 19, and it's touching on what Kenny said earlier about absolute last resort and eviction where children are, are uh, involved. We have a, a statement here uh, about uh, an eviction panel and building a process of further prevention strategies where private landlords and RSLs inform the council of forthcoming evictions. So... They are like to they are like to evict and they are like to evict children. And we've got to take up the slack. Is that why one of the reasons we increased the the, uh, the home seekers uh, numbers in the, in the allocation policy? Because I mean, how can they how can they evict people and and, and we've got to take up the slack there? Uh, maybe I'm reading it wrong. I don't know. Kenny, convener. Uh, like everything, uh, Councillor Blackwood, there's due process to go through, and uh, certainly at this present time now, uh, the, 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 there is obviously restrictions on evictions now because of COVID-19 at the present time, and uh, a private landlord has to go through due process before it does evict. There is legal processes you need to go through, and it's a very last resort, and that doesn't happen over a couple of weeks. There's four or five months of uh, conversations that go on. One of the things that we're doing more now that before that gets that is about what intervention process you can do, what support's required, you know, because sometimes the word eviction, depending on what that means, it might be that the private landlord's something to sell up, there might have been a death, the property then's moved on. So it just defines what the word eviction means. It could mean that the property is no longer available. What I will say is we have a, a corporate responsibility for anybody who becomes homeless. So, regardless if it's children or not, so we would always look at uh, to do that. However, our RSL partners, other partners, they do support us in that, and we do use private landlords where possible. This has nothing to do with the allocations policy that we spoke earlier. This is about our housing first, rapid rehousing model. Uh, this will help us obviously deal with the homelessness, and it certainly helps us with at the present times with the. Uh, Recent, with the current pandemic, because of the amount of people that are homeless, an idea that we can't move them on to the areas that I've, I've spoke about earlier. Okay, thank you, Vinar. Thanks, Kenny. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. Uh, Dennis, do you want to do another shot at it? I see you've got your new here uh, headphone. It's. It's a strange experience not hearing you actually speak. 
He's on mute. Can I just say, can we sometimes when headphones are in, they've got an on off switch on the cable or on the earpiece, and maybe that's what's switching it off. I could be wrong, I don't have headphones myself. You're still muted, according to You're on mute as well, convenient, Dennis. I'm sorry, Dennis. We we just can't hear you. David, well, well, you're we're waiting, uh, David. David Balfour. Yeah, thanks, Kadir. Um <coughs> Just a couple of points. Uh, one that Councillor Black raised was the. Uh, um, cycle route out to uh, Bowness. <clears throat> um, the path that runs to Bowness uh, currently, um, I've raised it in the past, um, and it's not really been sorted. the The path is very overgrown, and it's at some points the uh, the path is only a, a few inches wide, um, which means if somebody's going along there on a push bike, and there's vehicles come along uh, the road, they're very very close to the vehicles. Um, so maybe if that can be looked at again, and maybe the, that path scraped all the way back to Bowness. Um, the other, <clears throat> there's another couple of things. Repairs. I've I've had quite a few uh, coming in that are ones that have kind of been lost in in the process, if you like, um, and they've been waiting on them getting repaired for a long time. However, mm -hmm. saying that, when I contact Mr. McGee and his team. Uh, I've got to say they're right on the ball and the, the try and get stuff sorted out right away. So uh, that side is very good. Um, and just one other question: the we mentioned about the uh, enforcement team. How many uh, enforcement officers have we got, and how many are actually available um, to do patrols and stuff at the moment? David, uh, Douglas, can you pick up? I'll, I'll get an update for Councillor Balfour just to give an, an update on the number of, of enforcement officers we have in our team, and pr presumably Kenny can give details on the, the wardens on, on his yep. side. And I'll pick up <coughs> with the, our the environment team in relation to the maintenance on the, the path uh, between Grangemouth and Bowness. Okay, thanks for that. Kenny, do you want to come back in? Yeah, Councillor Bob, within the, the housing set, the wardens, we have six uh, wardens who patrol and do that, and they're available most of the times, depending on what their shift patterns are. With regards to repairs, and, and thank you very much, and I appreciate that some repairs are missed or some are. To give a bit of context to that, there is over circa 50,000 repairs done a year, and uh, you're absolutely right, we will miss some of them. And uh, the thing that does help is if we are contacted by either tenants or yourself to make us aware of that, we try as much as possible to respond as quickly and efficiently as possible as well. Yeah, certainly, um, in my experience, they've been very, very good if I've flagged something up that they've missed. So, thanks for that. Lorna, sorry to keep you waiting. That's no problem, thank you. It's, it's, we'll all be aware regarding getting outside in the fresh air. It's good for your mental health. Many more people in the community are doing that. They're cycling, they're walking. This is very important. It's just as important or more important than obviously, you know, giving food to communities is very important as well. It's because of all the changes because of the pandemic. So with regard to sustainable act travel programme, and considering the landscape we've got in Falkland, which is a good walking area, many canal paths and things like that for cyclists. Can you provide an, uh, an update of the impl implementation of this work? Because really, communities are not seeing any improvements. And obviously, there is a sense of urgency. And we want the different people's behaviours to sustain as we're going forward. And also, what I would like to ask with regard to funding, did Fulbright Council apply for enough funding? Because I believe there was a lot of money in the pot of the Scottish Government. I also believe there's a second application going forward, and um, will all councillors be aware of that and be able to, you know, give you suggestions with regard to where people in the community have come forward to for improvements in their network and their canal network and paths and things like that. 
So I was wondering if it's possible to have an update on the implementation because there is a sense of urgency just now, you know, for people at the moment to get outside and we should be encouraging everyone in our community to get out there and go out there and walk about and cycle safely in our communities. Douglas, Douglas, can you respond? Yep, yep, happy to do that, uh, Councillor. So, um, I, I can get a note uh, to give some further detail on the range of measures that we've been promoting there. Ob obviously, um, Falkirk does have an extensive core paths network, and in fact, we were recognised last year as the best walking neighbourhood in the UK as a consequence of the, the work that's been taking place there. Um, we have uh, been successful in tapping into funds through uh, SUSTRANS and Scottish Government in uh, past years to uh, develop and, and uh, sustain that, that network. And there are no, a number of measures being pursued now uh, to promote further uh, cycleways. Um, so the likes of the, the, the uh, new funds that were announced uh, by Scottish Government uh, arising from the COVID uh, situation, there has been a number of uh, schemes tapped into for that, but I can get more details uh, of those to Councillor uh, Binney. Thank you. Do you agree there's a sense of urgency with this actually at the moment because we do want to sustain active exercise, people going outdoors um, at present? Absolutely, and, and the team are very active. Um, you know, in, in fact, we had a we had a squad out um, doing repairs to the Fankerton Bridge just a few weeks back after the impact of the flooding. Uh, they are recently quite a major exercise that they had to do to get that repair done uh, quickly, acknowledging the fact that people were looking to use facilities like that. So the team are are very motivated and active around this. And uh, we certainly see the need uh, to get this augmented as, as well as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, David, Councillor Grant. Thank you. Um, it's a question for Mr. Gillespie um, regards to page 19. Good. Um, with regards to the, the strain on the, the, the seekers. As you know, uh, Kenny, I have voiced my opinion a couple of times about when, why we, we changed it from the 33% to the 45%, etc. Um, has there been any feedback, Kenny, from any well, residents since we implemented the 45% rather than the 33, 33, 33? Um, I'm just um, interested to see if there's been any um, feedback on that. Thank you. Convener, uh, thanks. Uh, Councillor Grant, the, the actual uh, new allocations policy only started live in October just there. And as uh, members will be aware, we have an outstanding remit after a year to come back and feed back on the split to members to look at it. I have to be honest, we're only really less than a month into play the now with the new, so I've not got any tangible evidence the now. Uh, in regards to the split, and, we'll pro and we're probably still at the present time working with some of the backlog all uh, allocations of houses that uh, our bill maintenance team or have been awarded that are now coming fresh and that our bill maintenance teams are getting to us. So we're still early stages yet, but uh, we certainly have an outstanding remit to come back on that. Uh, for the convener, could I also, I think earlier, just a point uh, through modern technology. I think I was asked earlier who delivered the dementia training. Uh, happy to say it was Age Scotland from earlier. Uh, I've been advised by my training team. You yeah, asked the question, you know. Thanks for that, Kenny. Thank you, Dennis. Could you? <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah. Oh, well, thank goodness for that. I was just going to smash this computer. Anyway, but everybody's uh, been fine, and I thank you for your patience. But the main issue, are, the two main issues I would like to talk about, and I'm glad that Robert Miller has, has come back online. If you look at some of the schools, particularly in Camlin, in Camlin Education Centre, have been the worst. The refuse has been lying there for about four months. 
It's, dump, it's, it's dumping people of this, making dumping sites, and it's it's so unsightly, it's unbelievable. It must also be a hazard. Now, I know that a lot of people have reported, particularly Cameron Education Centre, it is an absolute disgrace, and it's a health hazard. Now, I know that it's illegal dumping that's happening, but something has to be done if he, anybody wants to be to see that. So I would ask that, that something get done about that. The other thing, because there's been a lot of points raised and all very valid, but some of the other stuff that I would like to talk about is the care of people in their homes and the placing of people in homes who could be on life's downward cycle, as they say, and probably, I mean, I'm not a doctor, probably a, a great number of these people have got medical conditions. However, the treatment that people are receiving at the minute, the neighbours, we, we keep talking about what we care about our neighbours. Now, we're talking, I'm talking to elderly people who, unfortunately, are getting people put in beside them in the same four in a block or in the same high flat. I think there's a story today might be in the Falk of Hell, I'm not sure. But these people, their lives are a total misery. 24 hours a day, and during the lockdown, these people couldn't even go out. Now, I'm just going to come quickly to the point, because we've been very fair. I think we have to realise and take more care, especially during the pandemic, when people couldn't escape a problem neighbour. And I'm not sure, but the Queen's are trying their best, I appreciate that. But I'm, sure, I'm sorry to say they've fallen well short of the mark, and that may be down to finances or lack of uh, lack of uh, enough numbers. But something has to be done about it, can we? Thank, Thank you. you for that. Wish to respond, Robert? Could you, Robert Neilan? Uh, just, just in terms of the first point that uh, Councillor Goldie raised in, in terms of uh, litter around schools and particularly Camelon Education Centre, uh, I'll, I'll take that away and get somebody to look into it uh, today. Thank wasn't you. Aware, wasn't, wasn't aware that that was that was an issue, Councillor. It's not been raised with me so far, but I'll, I'll look into it. Okay, thanks for that. Mark, you want to come? Just following what Robert said there, in terms of what Councillor Goldie's question about uh, illegal dumping at Camley Education Centre, that was raised with me yesterday at four o'clock. My understanding is that that's now been actioned today, and it'll be removed ASAP by waste. Okay, thank you. Brendan. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, do you want to come back in? No, just to thank the people, but uh, we need to talk. I need to talk to somebody about this. The carry on with the housing because. It's going to cost people lives. And I must say this, I'm not trying to be partly political, because we're all involved in the moving to the headquarters and things. People question how we can organise to move a full full workforce, but we can't really organise to protect some elderly person in their home. And that is a big issue, convener. Thank you. Quite well taken. Um, Could I come in on that? Alison, yes. Yeah, which is, I, I would agree with Dennis. I think that I have had several inquiries in recent months that have been quite uh, upsetting. And, and when I spoke about mental health earlier on, I was thinking about that as well. And I think that the officers that are having to deal with these types of inquiries are, are struggling as well as the people who are having to uh, live with these types of issues. And I think that I know that the at a national level, we have to, we've got certain criteria and we have to be careful what we do when we're pe putting people in houses, etc. But when we had years ago, when we had where older people stayed beside older people, families stayed beside families, I don't think there was as much pressure in, in, in terms of different lifestyles. And I think that the system itself has created real difficulties and people are really, really suffering and struggling, especially due to lockdown. And I think that is a really serious issue. Thanks, Alison. Can you not know? Uh, don't disagree with what local members said. I've said uh, in regards to the heightened issues, regards to what the lockdown has caused. You're absolutely right. We're well aware of that and uh, the support that's required. And I think some of that will be covered in the following report under the ASB about how that has been picked up, and I'm sure Natalie will go into more detail in that report. 
What I will say is take on board what local members have said. That is why we've got a rapid rehousing uh, transitional plan on Housing First. It's very much getting, as I said earlier in our response to the question, is getting their early intervention and making sure that we can get the right support in place. And that's just not about homeless. That's about every requirement. So where there is somebody who are either elderly or have ailments or who where we want to put people, that can be discussed it can be discussed through a, a cross a party, well cross service a meeting and we do where possible. We do have some initiatives in place. But what I would say is there has to be real reasoning going forward to why we have special lettings in place. So we, you are aware that we have them at the high rise flats, we have them in uh, Stenisweer and other areas, depending on what the properties are. We do try our best where possible, but because we've got a choice based letting system, uh, it says what it says in the tin that people do get a choice. But taking on board what members say, that's something that uh, the team and myself are looking at further to see how we can help to support individuals going forward. But I think, again, that will be covered a bit more in Natalie's report uh, following this one, Councillor. Kimina. Thank you. If anyone else wishes to uh, contribute, we please uh, wave their hands or something to me. But in uh, the meantime, I, Robert, Robert Spears, uh, Robert, are you still there? And if so, do you wish to come in at all? Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm still here. Yeah, I would say there has been an increase in um, problems, especially with problem tenants. Uh, um, I, I got one particular from Bones, where uh, a boarded up property actually had someone living in it, and there was uh, great problems created in, in the whole four floors. Um, it's a difficult situation. We, we're living in difficult times. People react differently to lockdown. Um, we can't continually just blame the, the, the housing or the lighting system. We've got to realise that um, maybe police involvement needs to be increased. There's different agencies there that can get involved. But we are, we are where we are, and we're stuck with the laws of the land. Um, I, I don't envy our housing department in the least trying to handle this. It's especially difficult for elected members who are, are, are getting a pull in the face from their constituents. What we need to do is put out a, a state calm message. You know, let's all get through this together. And if you're creating difficulties for a neighbour, then you should feel shame in yourself. Thank you for that, Robert. Anyone wish to respond or comment or add their a bit to that? Um, if not, um, I think um, it's a it's a huge uh, a, a agenda item, and uh, we can only really, in fact, I think, actually touch on it. But if uh, anyone wishes wishes to 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 uh, to speak, if not, um, I think um, we simply uh, should uh, go on now and uh, uh, note the, the, the recommendation that uh, we consider the, 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 it says, consider the performance of the council against the priority of communities within the corporate plan. Um, and I think we've um, touched on that today. And I think it will just be the start of uh, many questions to officers. I thank officers very much for their attendance and for members for their contributions. and. Um, Move then on to item six, agenda item six on antisocial behaviour. Um, in, in, in Natalie, are you going to lead on that one for us? Yes, thank you, Convener. So I'll probably not be as brief as Mr. Gillespie running through the report, but I won't go through the full report, just highlight the salient points. So, section one, the purpose of the report is to provide the committee with a six month update on the progress in implementing the recommendations arising from the scrutiny panel review of antisocial behaviour. Section two, the committee is asked to note the progress made regarding the two outstanding actions that were presented at committee on the 30th of January. The two recommendations that are carried over and we are reporting on today relate to the review of the support services, um, which is outlined in section three. 
So the support services were reviewed as part of our restructure and centralisation of the service in 2019. And we recognise the support we provide is key to the successful resolution and reduction of antisocial behaviour. We review support provision and respond to people's support needs on a daily basis by responding to and engaging with people on a person by person basis. A support needs assessment is completed for each service user, um, both at the beginning of their case and throughout the duration of their case to ask what support they require and really build relationships with people, both perpetrators and victims, to help them to speak freely and tell us what support it is that they require. But as part of the review, we felt that a, a telephone survey would be helpful to formalise the, the feedback from our clients. So as part of the, the feedback, we undertook a telephone survey earlier this year, and 100% of respondents confirmed that we were able to provide the support that they required, and they had no additional support needs. Our person-centred approach means that we are able to remain flexible and adaptable to pe meet people's needs, um, and we have engaged specific specialist services during our cases, um, such as engaging support for PTSD, Alzheimer support, um, along with a range of others. Section three, in terms of guidance for members, due to the current circumstances, we have put a uh, some information online, which includes the members' information leaflet and also the presentation for members, both of which are available within the, the members' folder um, that you have online. The information leaflet is also available on the, the website. Once things do slacken, then we will be able to look at meeting virtually, but absolutely welcome the opportunity for members to speak to individual service managers and coordinators to find out more about any specific area. Whilst um, Section 3 and 3.9, whilst the purpose of the report related to the two actions described above, we have taken the opportunity to update members um, to give a, a view in terms of what we have experienced during the COVID restrictions, as we have already discussed and, um, and alluded to today. And I'm sure that you have been hearing from from your members. Things have been very difficult over the the, the restrictions. Um, you'll see from the report that there has been a 58 percent increase in antisocial behaviour, and we've, we've taken that during the time when the restrictions were at their height. So the period of shielding from the 1st of April to the 31st of July. And you can see there that our antisocial behaviour complaints, so that's the number of complaints that came through the ESB reporting line, increased from 1,034 in 2019 to 2,442. Now, it's important to highlight that this is reflective of um, the experience nationally. It's reflective of what the police have been reporting, and it's also reflective of what the other local authorities have been reporting as well. The situation that the COVID restrictions created meant that we had households who were a lot busier than usual, whilst schools, universities and workplaces were closed. It meant that people were at home for longer periods of time. More people were in, within the house, and also it's important that we recognise that there is a real heightened anxiety and stress amongst people and individuals, and indeed households. So, what we have seen over that time is that people's ability to manage and ability to cope with sometimes what would be day-to-day -day noise became exacerbated. Families also struggled to keep children entertained, which led to an increase in family living noise. So, throughout the lockdown, the increases reflect around a 30 per cent split in terms of types of behaviour people were complaining about. Um, so, that is really low level intervention and not as many serious antisocial behaviour cases. So, about 30 per cent of the 
is related to mediation cases. 30% are related to what we deem as early intervention and practical solutions. 30% um, around investigation and issuing warnings, and a small percent of them being more serious cases. So that's really been our experience during the, the lockdown period. Throughout that time, our support provision adapted um, to meet the needs that people were raising with us, which very much reflect what we've been discussing this morning. It's been around mental health, mental well-being, feeling isolated, feeling lonely, um, and really just struggling um, from varying degrees from generally having low days to actually um, feeling quite suicidal. So the staff have been able to respond to that appropriately, and they have been able to access additional services for people, such as Empowering Healthy Minds, RVS, and um, we are also working towards helping build and reduce isolation through digital technology. Um, just picking up on the, the point that Councillor Black made earlier, one of the recommendations from our previous report in section 4.2 referred to, this is the, the report that came to committee in January, referred to the service being able to support and engage with um, specific areas and members within the community, such as the elderly and the young people. So one of the things that we're actively working on just now is whilst el the elderly can't meet in communal facilities, we are undertaking a work in some survey with them to try and increase their ability to use digital technology um, by providing training um, and advice to try and help prevent the areas of um, isolation and help residents come together um, virtually. So we're very, very much working towards adapting at the situation as it is now is at the moment and as we continue to foresee moving forward. The service is now fully operational within the, the communities and we are compliant with the, the recommended um, guidance in terms of social distancing. Prior to um, the, the easing of the restrictions, we did continue to deliver the service, albeit it was virtually. So we did that through telephone mediation sessions and also facilitating discussions between neighbours to try and help them come up with. Um, the solutions that would work for would work for them. We do, however, recognise that whilst I have referred to the low level types of complaints, there's no escaping the fact that there is an increase of in socialising within the home, and with that comes alcohol consumption and at times breaking of the regulations with having more people within the house. So we do recognise. That is a, a growing concern, and that is something that we have been working quite closely with Police Scotland to address. And during lockdown, there were um, joint warnings issued from both Falkirk Council and Police Scotland with regards to that. The Executive is asked to note the progress made, and thank you for your interest in the report. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, uh, Natalie. Thank you for your your report. Um, the the, uh, the 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 report obviously follows up uh, working the working group um, of, of our my members. Um, I just wonder if anyone would like to. I, I do apologise. Uh, trying to see uh, David, David, David Balfour. You want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, got a few questions. Um, the survey. Uh, Surveys that were carried out, there was only 25 out of yeah. 2,442 reports. Um, can we possibly increase that somewhat? Um, and also, what areas were the uh, the surveys carried out? As in, what what locations? Um, in my experience, uh, when I've reported in. in at times, it's fair enough. By the time people get to me, it's it's kind of progressed a bit somewhat. But uh, many up, and they seem to take a very, very long time to sort out. Um, and the hundred percent saying that they feel supported. Um, 
as a as I say, the, by the time people get to me, um, what they're saying is we've reported this so many times, and the council's doing nothing. So that's that's the other side of what I'm getting. Um, so if you can maybe give us a wee bit of information on that. Um, thank you for the question, Councillor Balfour. The, just to clarify, the 2,442 figure quoted is the number of complaints that we received during July, April to July 2020. The telephone survey that was carried out was back in January of 2020. And the people, the area that it covered would have been across the whole of the Falkirk area. And the way that we identified people was through cases that were closing. So we had a two week period whereby every case that, that was um, at the case closure process, as part of the case closure process, we um, we have a, a conversation at the end to confirm with people what the current position is, ask for some feedback and obviously advise what to do if anything um, does happen again. So as part of that case closure process, that's where we carried out the telephone survey. Um, we do throughout the whole of our work and engagement continually ask people if there is any support that they, they require. Um, but the telephone survey was really used as a, a formal mechanism of recording and capturing that because it's not something that until then we had captured. Okay, so the 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 surveys that you did that that was every um, case that was getting closed. So you had a, a range of different types of cases. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Okay, and again, it was an equal split, and we also had from the twenty five, nineteen of these were victims and witnesses, and six of these were traitors of the antisocial behaviour as well. Okay, and is there is there scope to extend that to to cover more surveys to give a, a better indication of how things are going? We could consider that. We did uh, in the past. We always asked people for feedback, so we used to provide a postal survey at every every case that was closed. The reason we stopped do, doing that is we found the return rate was extremely low. We then moved on to trying to speak to people, um, do a follow-up case closure survey. Um, but again, response was very low. Um, and particularly one of the reasons we identified was that people are too keen um, in receiving calls when the it's caller ID, um, which is why the sample survey and the, the telephone survey was used. But I'm happy to consider um, additional support survey if that's something that um, is going to be of value. I would say, though, that with the the way that we are working, particularly in relation to lockdown, um, we're very much focusing on more in-depth discussions around how people are coping, and we are finding that people are able to um, speak a bit more freely than what they have previously when they aren't coping. Okay. Um, do we have any information on how long um, cases are taking, and uh, a kind of average, and maybe the longest um, sort of case, um, and also how many repeat calls that people are putting in for a case? Like, if they've got to keep phoning every week for months, yeah. sort of thing. Is there any data on that? I can give you averages. I can I can advise that um, firstly with legal cases they are they are long. I mean they are they're long and protracted by nature. Um, so we can have a case say for perhaps six six to eight months prior to um, moving into court action. Once we're in court, you'll appreciate that court that case stays open with us for a, a number of years, which can be two years for the whole duration of the ASPO. In comparison, mediation cases are generally um, kind of between four to six weeks for them to be resolved. The investigation conflict resolution cases are around six months. However, that's very dependent on the frequency of the behaviour and um, how 
how well we're able to identify corroboration of a complaint. We do have a very structured process and we work through uh, a methodological approach using the national government's um, PIERC framework. So there are various steps that we, we move through to ensure there is engagement with the perpetrator whilst we are supporting the, the victims. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. Okay. Thank you. David, you Thank you, convener. Um morning, Natalie. Um I've just got a Good couple morning. of questions. Um see that when we were Councillor Balfour touched on it briefly there, when we're making a, a complaint um as a councillor, when they come to us, they yes, are usually at their wits end and we say my advice to them is look you must keep reporting and um to either the council or the police or, or to both. This is um, they get fed up reporting because sometimes they think nothing's getting done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do we have such a thing in the council that if they stop reporting, then the, the, the antisocial behaviour person is then given a kind of new lease of life, as if they became good? Is there a time limit on that kind of thing? Um, if you want to use yes, that one. Yes, there is. Yeah. Um, what is the time when it... So each case is we look at a six months um period. So generally if a warning is issued and the person there is no further complaints for a six month period, that is the guidance that officers work to if there that, that would be then be uh back to the beginning for a first warning. However, there are occasions when by the nature of complaints that is that's not the case. To give two examples of that, we have had neighbours, for example, who have a caravan, take the caravan away so they're not home and able to report. Doesn't mean to say the behaviour stopped, it's just that they're not there to um to uh witness it. Another example could be where the perpetrator moves away from their property for a considerable period of time. So again, it's not been a change in behaviour, it's the fact that they've not been present to to cause the antisocial behaviour. So again, there's always a person-centred approach around flexibility, but we balance that out with um, consistency. Thank you. Um, see the, the mediation, um, what usually happens with us, um, they come and they tell us what's wrong and we go on to use guys or the police, etc. And then the, the, the step is mediation. Do we have a, a success rate of figures how that works? Because they don't then get back in touch with us and say, um, I met the neighbour, we are in mediation and everything's great. They don't get back to us in that stage. Is there such a thing as statistics, how the mediation works? Yeah, we do. Um, the complexity with mediation is when, whether people are willing or not, mediation is highly affected when both parties are agreeable. Um, and really, we're up in the 90s. If 90%, if people are willing, then generally that's the percentages we're looking at people moving through the process and coming out with a long term resolution. Our challenge is when people do not want to participate, that uh, that's the challenge, whether that be the person who is complaining. And quite often, particularly now during lockdown, with people's tolerance levels being lower and their well-being being poorer, they don't want mediation. They don't feel able to do that. And secondly, they want a quick fix. They just want the, the person to be moved, um, which, as we know, is, is not, is not a, a quick fix and it's not our desired approach. Um, last one, convener. Thank you. I do understand that with people don't want to do the mediation, but I was just wondering when, when the, the both parties do agree how, how the success was rate or and it seems to be actually very good. And um, last one, Natalie. Um the the noise recording machines, you know, when people have said they're getting noise during the night and all this kind of stuff. Uh, are they back on or are we still can't do them because of COVID, you know, the officers couldn't go in to put the machines in. Uh, has that been um, updated? Thank you, Councillor, for the question. I'm delighted to say they are back in and they are up and running. 
We have two machines um, with potentially another one on loan coming from environmental health. So there is uh, a good success rate in the use of the noise monitoring equipment. You rightly identify the challenges that we encountered, but we have um, changed the way that we work to enable the officers to be able to go in and install this safely and remove it safely. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Convener. Councillor Gordy, can you get back in? Yeah, can you hear me, Convener? Yes, I can hear you. Right, well, first of all, Natalie, I've got great admiration for the work that you and your people do. So anything that might appear as a criticism that's coming is of the system uh, and not of the, the, the staff. I do realise the difficulties you have. But my concerns are when the council allocates a person who, as I say, is on downward, life downward spiral, could be terribly ill, really, really mental issues. And strangely enough, to put them in the high flats appears to be kind of favourite at the minute. Kenny's shaking his head. Um, but I hope, I, hope, um, I hope he's going to hear me out here. I've been dealing with a case on Lorna Winnie's ward, and I don't know if Lorna's been involved with it, but Pat Reed has, where a person was placed in exactly one year ago this week. Well, people's lives in, the hive, in that block of flats have been a misery. One couple in particular, as I say, I, I've not seen the herald, but the, the, the gentleman in the house has got very bad eyesight, his, his sight's very badly impaired, and his wife's health has deteriorated in the last year immeasurably. So the council have tried to put in carers and things like that. Carer was to go in overnight, and then once the carer said, well, that's fine now, I think everything's all right. So they disappear, and then all hell breaks loose. These people are in that situation because, in my view, the council puts somebody in a house that they shouldn't be in. So the person that's ill shouldn't be in that house because it's affecting his care, and it's also affecting the care of other people. Now, Tony did say about the same issues, but there are letting issues in some areas. They're letting, it's a, I forget the word Tony, but it's, it means we need to set letting in certain areas to deal with problems. I've been dealing with another problem in my own ward that's been going on for about five years. And when I met the housing staff, uh, I met Tony's colleague, and I said, look, Maybe we need to look at this corner here because there appears to be a lot of problems, as I say, with people in life's downward trend. Flat refusal under no circumstances will you look at that. So my concern is for it's Kenny and Natalie, but the housing staff in general, it's the council that's created the problem and trying to manage one problem the council have created the problem in Green Bank Court. There is no question about that. So what is the answer? That's, the, that's what I want to know, both from Kenny and yourself. What is the answer when I meet these people later today? What am I going to say to them? I think, I think the answer to go is the end is in sight. Do these people have to move? Or do we put the person who is ill into a proper, a proper place where he should where it should be, because this is the council creating this problem through no fault of the room, because I do know that they've got to allocate houses, but you surely got to take a bit of greater care than that. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I think, Kenny, I think you wish to come in. Yeah, and, and firstly, just for me to clarify, I certainly am not brave enough to shake my head, Councillor Goldie. It was no. difficult hearing you on the phone at the time. No apologies. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, no, you're absolutely right in regards to uh, the changing environment that we, we live in. And it's been highlighted earlier from various councillors. And one of the things that's certainly part of our Falkirk plan is our mental well-being. The other issues that we deal with now, uh, we're, we'll all be pleased to hear with uh, on the call, is that we're, we're all living longer as well. And that, because that provides its own issues as well and support. Uh, and uh, certainly from the last information that got at uh, uh, the mail 
Uh, males are actually catching up on females as well, so I don't know if that's uh, good or bad, depending, going forward. But that does come with additional health issues, and we do work much more closely uh, with our other partners in health and social care and making sure that we get the right uh, support for individuals. We, we have a transparent uh, allocations policy. We very much our policy. We look at our qualities. We make sure that we can do the best as far as we see it for everybody involved. But you're absolutely right. We are in difficult times now, and uh, things will go on again. But I think it all it all comes back to where we, as multiple services, work together to support all individuals, but also make sure we can do that at the most earliest opportunity to try and alleviate any of the issues. Natalie, do you wish to say anything? We'll respond to cases on an individual basis, um, but I think Mr Gillespie's covered the principle. Thank you. Um, I, I see that um, Alison and uh, Lorna are wanting to come in, but Dennis, uh, do you wish to raise anything else where you feel you've well, got the floor? Well, I feel, I feel like a, a recipient of the service now. Both Mr Gillespie and Natalie have spoken. But the answer when I go and see these people today as well, nothing's going to happen, nothing new. It's just your life's going to be a misery for the rest of the time you're in this block. That's not good enough. And I should say, when I said the council caused the problem, this is not a normal allocation. This is a person who requires great medical treatment, and I'm quite sure there'll be a great deal of thought into why he was placed in that block. But you, so. I'm going to leave here today and say, sorry, folks, nothing's changing. Yeah. Okay. Well, pass on now, I think, to Alison. Thanks. I mean, I mean I've, uh, obviously, as councillors, we, we, we deal with neighbourhood is neighbour issues quite a lot. And I, I, over the years, I've, I've dealt with the mediation service quite a lot, and I, I, I have seen them, you know, have outstanding results. I think they do a brilliant job. I'm concerned about the numbers that they're having to deal with just now. I'm concerned about how the, the staff's well being having to deal with over double the amount of numbers that they normally have. That's a lot, a big increase. Uh, and over the years, I have had to have difficult conversations, and I, I do think that the training's useful. I was a psychiatric nurse for 18 years and I have done my mental health first aid training. But even at that, I have had a few conversations where I've, I would have liked to think I could have maybe done a bit better. Uh, and it does say in page 24 that councillors are going to be offered training and, a, and, a, and mental health training and having challenging conversations. And I think that is really needed. Uh, and I think it'll be, I, I will be taken up, not the mental health training, but I'll be taken up at the challenging conversations training. Uh, I think that especially for new councillors, this is a, definitely a minefield, but I do, I do have concerns about the staff and their wellbeing because this is a very difficult, uh, challenging role in normal circumstances, never mind the increase that they're having to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Black. The staff wellbeing has um, been a priority across the whole of, of housing and communities, and we have um, provided additional training for for staff, um, which is in relation to the um, empowering healthy minds, which was previously FIDAM. It was a 20-hour course and it really was aimed at helping people not only support their client groups, um, which at the time was primarily through the role for support for people, but also help them to manage their own well-being. Um, so that's one way that we've tried to support that, and we will be rolling that out to all housing and community staff um, over the coming months. The staff themselves are very well trained and they are very well supported through regular um, regular debriefs and, and coaching, particularly in relation to the mediation aspect. 
But you're right, not being within their workplace next to their colleagues is something that we have heard across the service. People are feeling the impact of that. But the way that we're trying to respond to that is supporting each other in different ways. Um, but thank you for highlighting that there is a, a good job that they do, and it definitely is a trying one. And I'm sure training will be arranged for members as soon as we're, we're able to when restrictions ease. Are you going back in, Alison? See that I recently took part in a political mentoring course, and we did role play etc. online, and I found that really, really useful. I found the role play was actually easier to do on a one-to-one -one basis on, on via screen than it would be in reality. So I think that this is probably the ideal time to get training for counsellors, you know, and, and deal with you know, having challenging conversations because it's actually easier to do it online. And I'm sure there must be somebody somewhere that, 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 that does training on that. Um, I'm happy to take that as a, an action. <laughs> okay, thank you. Lorna, do you wish to come in? Yes, um, I, I just want to come in actually and be very complimentary. You know, I've had quite a lot of deals of conflict resolution, and just recently in my ward, I had a very difficult case that had been lasting a long time, and I was so impressed by one of the officers because it's not black and white, it's not straightforward, it's extremely complex, and it's it's about believing either party. But behind that, you've obviously got to get the evidence there before you can move forward, and sometimes that takes a lot of time. So I do understand um, reasons why they can take longer and things like that. Uh, but the only thing I was going to say is, with regard to communities and um, with regard to antisocial behaviour, it's probably quite good to find out the, the percentage, perhaps, that is uh, connected to mental health issues. It might not all be. Um, with regard to that, and with regard to mental health issues, and if the officers have been trained in these matters to a degree, I, I wouldn't imagine they'll be as professional maybe as mental health nurses, etc. Because that is a professionalism. How quickly are you able to get people the help from our, our partners uh, with any mental health issues that they have? Because obviously that that would help the, obviously the conflict that is there at, at the present moment. Is that not for you, Natalie? Is that something you can ask? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Binney, can I just clarify for question? I know you've made a, a, a number of points there, but was there a specific question? Yes, there was a specific question. When, when you've got a case, in actual fact, and you identify it's perhaps maybe a mental health issue, uh, how quickly can you get that support <laughs> from the partner who could provide that support to the actual person. Uh, and obviously, if they get that support, that might help their um, complaint about antisocial behaviour. Does, does that happen? If you know what I mean, they've maybe got a yes, issue. And for example, yes. if you get them that support, if they get a little bit of help, that issue has maybe disappeared. Yes, I, I, I do. do. Thank, you for thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> The underlying issue generally is the antisocial behaviour generally is an underlying issue for that, and that is our aim to find out what is the cause of that underlying issue, which, as you quite rightly say, often can be um, a, a, a mental health issue. Um, likewise, we do find our witnesses can suffer from mental health illness. We have not experienced challenges in relation to signposting people onto the services that we use. And that is because we have the, the joint working arrangements in place um, with who was previously SIP, but we have GROW. Um, there has also been work and developments in relation to housing needs and additional access to support there through the Housing First and the Rapid Rehousing model. So, again, we're, we're fortunate to have links there. Um, clearly, if it's going through the GP route, I can't comment because, um, you know, once that once advice is given to go to a GP, that's something that we would be looking for people to do on their own. So that's not, not something we can do for them, but specifically relating to um, identified support and wellbeing concerns through who we use. We're, we're fortunate with the partnerships and the access to resources that we have. 
with, with regard to the, the, the partnership services that you have, regard to the time scale that people can get help, is it quite quickly or or it depends actually probably on the the question or the issue? I'll confirm what the service targets are for the, the, the partner agency, but in my experience and from my knowledge in discussing cases like this at case conference, it's a pretty quick response. Um, you know, and we can we can ask for for cases to be prioritised, and that priority is given. But I'll confirm what the service standards are and come back to you. I'm pleased that you can prioritise cases. That's good. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I don't You're welcome. See, I don't see anyone else indicating they wish to to speak. I'm grateful to people for um, dealing with this very difficult and important subject without being too uh, specific as to, to cases, it's always a temptation. Um, I, I think at that particular point, we'd like to move on to the to the purpose of the report, which is simply to review the whole, uh, uh, the whole behavior in question. And we thank Natalie very much for uh, leading that with us and uh, recognize how important it is to each one of us the, to, to be, uh, up to speed and they have confidence in the responses to the antisocial behaviour issues. Um, before we go on to um, the, the, the next uh, and final item, um, I wonder if we would perhaps take a five minute uh, break, if you don't mind, till we have some perhaps of a, a coffee or something, if you'll just uh, leave uh, for just for five minutes. Okay, thank you. Can I just maybe say to everybody, we'll have a, a five minute break, so we'll be back at, um, just after 10 to. If you can put your your microphones off onto mute and put your screens off as well, because um, this is obviously still being live streamed. streamed. Thanks.
Can we uh, now resume the, 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 the meeting? Turn to agenda item seven on the complaints annual report. Uh, and um, we'd ask uh, Caroline to uh, take us through the report. Thank you, Caroline. Oh, you're on mute, Caroline. <clears throat> Caroline, can you hear us and can you unmute? And uh, I think I'm unmuted now, convener. Sorry, sorry for that delay. Um, Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm here to present the council's annual complaints report for 2019-20. Um, as you know, we're required to produce this by uh, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, and it reports against the indicators set by the Ombudsman. Uh, the Council's complaints procedure, as you know, is a standard one that's used across uh, all councils in Scotland, um, and it has two stages. The first stage um, is for complaints to be responded to within five working days. Um, if that's not possible, it goes to the second stage, and the responses need to be submitted by 20 working days. The third stage of that, if people who have complained are not satisfied, they have the opportunity to take their complaint to the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. This report and the accompanying appendix um, demonstrate what our performance has been against the um, time scales and against the other indicators set by the SPSO during that time period. Um, the report itself just kind of takes a bit of an overview of some of the um, relevant points in relation to our performance, and uh, the accompanying appendix goes into a bit more detail. Um, so I'm talk briefly through the report, and um, I'm assuming you've all had a look at the appendix. If there's anything in more detail that you want to ask me, that's absolutely fine. Um, the, compl the considerations that the Ombudsman has set in terms of our performance indicators are complaints received per thousand uh, population, the number of complaints closed during the year, complaints upheld, partially upheld, and not upheld, our average response time. Our performance against time scales, the number of cases where an extension to the time scales has been authorised, customer satisfaction, and learning from complaints. And as I said, Appendix One provides um, detailed information setting out our performance against these indicators. There is no national benchmarking, uh, or no recent rather national benchmarking uh, information available in terms of complaints. But it's fair to say that when there has been performance information nationally. That we have compared kind of in broadly similar or better terms to um, the average across Scotland. Um, during uh, 1920, the council received more complaints per thousand population than we had um, 
received in the previous year, but despite that meaning that the, the burden in terms of responding to complaints is greater, our actual performance against our time scales is either better or the same as it had been previously. Um, we set out in the report the areas of service that generated the most um, complaints in terms of, um, you know, I suppose, the top 10 areas of complaints. And what the highest one of those was household waste collection followed by household repairs. In terms of household waste collection, the number of complaints went up fairly significantly during that year. But actually, it, it tipped into both the implementation of the burden bins across the council and um, also because this period just um, about moved into the early stages of our response to COVID when we were making a lot of changes to waste collection and that. Um, you know, sort of speaking to the services generated um, additional complaints of what we would expect. So I think when you're looking at the number of complaints that we received over that year, you might want to take that into into account. And as I say, even though the number has gone up, our response to them has um, remained um, remained broadly in line with what it's been in previous years. Um, in terms of our performance against time scales, 89% of the stage one complaints were closed within the five day deadline, and 63% of our stage two complaints were closed within the 20 day deadline. And in both cases, these are um, improvements on previous years. In terms of the stage two complaints, actually, we don't have that many complaints that go to stage two. Only 75 went to stage two in 1920 and 62 in 1819, which means that broadly speaking, we're dealing with the vast majority of our complaints within a, this five day work time period, which I think is um, you know, pretty, pretty good. Um, at four six, we talk about the top ten areas for complaints, and they're listed listed there um, for for um, stage one and also for stage two. Um, one of the other indicators from the SPSO is customer satisfaction. And in previous years, what we've done is we've done broad surveys of people who've complained and asked them whether they're happy. Not so much with the outcome of the complaint, but just how they were dealt with when they complained, and you know, in terms of communication with them. Um, and whether we got back to them in time. We haven't been able to do that this year for understandable reasons. Um, we felt that it wasn't really appropriate to start asking people about this when we were dealing with the, um, the ongoing COVID situation. But it's something that we very much got firmly planted to pick up next year as we the rest of the year to do that. We'll work on that. Um, the other thing um, indicator that the SPSO has is um, learning from complaints, and uh, that set out. In, in a, on a service by service basis in the appendix to the report in terms of what um, particular services are looking to do. You know, for example, housing and you know, Kenny will know about this to set up a, a customer um, focused uh, team to, to look at this area in, in detail and, and to um, work on um, improving responses. Um, I mentioned the third stage of the complaint procedure is going to the SPSO, and we saw a rise in the number of complaints referred to the SPSO during. Um, 1920. However, what I would say is that only one of the 22 that went to the SPSO was actually investigated by the SPSO. The others were felt not to be appropriate, and there were no recommendations coming from that. So I don't think that really tells us anything significant in terms of their complaints performance, because when the Ombudsman kind of looked at these things, it felt that it wasn't um, appropriate to investigate them further. Um, I think that's probably all I'll say just now, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, you were breaking up just occasionally there, I think, in the sound, but I'm sure that uh, members would get and appreciate your uh, contribution. Um, I, I'm not, yes, uh, Alison, uh, you want to come in? Yeah, it was just to ask, in, in 53, it tells you the stage one top 10 complaints and it goes on from there, but I just wondered. Maybe I've missed it, but what's the percentage? You know, like house and repairs, for example, is nine hundred and eighty. What's the percentage of total complaints? Because that that would give me a better idea. Well, that's nine hundred and eighty out of the. Um, we received four thousand nine hundred and seventy-nine complaints during the course of the year, and of those four thousand odd. 900 were in relation to housing repairs. What about, like, say, the, the, for example, housing repairs? How many housing repairs? I know you probably don't know it just now, but it would be helpful to see how many housing repairs are done in a year. 
so that we know the percentage of actual people that took it forward to complaint level to a formal complaint. <laughs> um, just, just, just as an example, just maybe for a future report, so we would know, you know, that, that what percentage of the actual total amount of housing repairs done, how many people felt they had to go and take it, make a formal complaint. Can, can, can Kenny just want to come in there? Can you come in there? Or... Yeah. Sorry, uh, convener. I did look at that, and uh, I'm very, very lucky and fortunate, Councillor Black, that uh, I did the maths on that, and it's actually just over 2.2 percent of right. the repairs, the complaints, of the total number, just about circa 50,000 repairs that I mentioned earlier. So we do get 2.2 percent of complaints as of repairs. Just bespoke to that. And I think I think that helps to put it into perspective. That maybe that's a. Maybe it's something that should be included in the future, so we do get us that sense of perspective. Eh? Thank you. Thank you, Alison. I think that is a, a, a helpful uh, contribution. Uh, Jim, Jim Blackwood. Thanks, Convener. Just Sorry. back to house repairs. I know we're saying it's only two point two percent. It's two point two percent too too high as, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, you, can you talk there on about L intervention and and again speaking to your your. Uh, if tenants in that tele intervention see a reduction in complaints about housing repairs. Uh, Councillor, uh, yeah, 2.2 per cent. You're right, uh, 97.8 per cent. If I took that home for schooling for an exam result, my mother would have been over the moon uh, with that performance. Uh, will it reduce uh, complaints for repairs? Uh, we try our best, and it's very much about educating what repairs need to be done. Because there is, we have minimum standards. We will make mistakes. We will get it wrong. There is no way doing circa fifty thousand repairs a year. We won't. But there's also an issue complaints of expectation, and there's a role for us to be more clearer of expectation as well. And I think that's one of the things that we we try and uh, develop through our groups using our tenants groups that we have, our scrutiny groups within housing as well. So it, I am hoping it reduces, but other things may come on. But a lot of it is to do with, one, we're human and mistakes will be made or things will happen. But also there's an education of what's expected at the same time, Councillor. Thanks, Kenny. I'm surprised you never got 90 plus percent at school. Really surprised. <laughs> Can you have another question, Kim? There, uh, one that surprises me is known to talk ten is complaints about the call centre. Is I've certainly complaints about the time people spend trying to get. I mean, it's it's not a problem that you get in, you get in the you phone the call centre and you you get connected. You then go through a, a process of eliminating what department you want to go to. When you get to that department, you can sit there for ages. A blank, a blank, no noise in the back, no indication of how long you're going to sit there. I mean, I've experienced it myself. I sat for 10 minutes, my mother, my mobile phone went, and I had to leave it there, and I went back and sat for another 10 minutes. And today, I still don't got a response to that, that, that department. I'm surprised we've not got a, maybe they, they can't get through to make a complaint, I don't know. I'm surprised the call centre complaints isn't high up in the, uh, in the top 10. I don't know if somebody can answer that. Anyone wish to come in there? Yeah. Convener, I've not got an answer, but happy to take it offline and take it back to our teams and come back to you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jim. Lorna, you're next in the line. It's just to say to Caroline, uh, thank you very much for this report. It's important as a council we've got a higher level of transparency. What I would like to ask, and I'll put little adds to as regard the, a bit, I need a bit more understanding, is the 521 staff conduct complaints. Um, can you give me a breakdown of this figure? What do you mean by staff conduct, for example? Is this a behavioural complaint or a dissatisfaction from a resident who's maybe not happy about something? Uh, and on to that, um, I have some questions uh, as well um, with regard um, with regard to the the percentage of complaints with regard to the number of employees that are face to face customer service. 
And is this staff conduct complaints? Is it internal? Because obviously you can get internal complaints from one officer to another, or is it external? So I break down in that as well. And just I'll finish now actually. Um, with regard to the complaints, what support and learning strategies have you put in place to improve the, uh, the conduct of these complaints? That's my question, sorry. <laughs> sorry, apologies. I lost my connection and had to go back in and back out again. So if I've missed any of your questions, I'm happy to pick them up. Now, could you perhaps just um, repeat your question, kind of, Do you want me to repeat it? If you, if I, you could. Yes, uh -huh. as, regarding, as regarding the staff conduct complaints, we're all aware that employees are the heart of folk at times and they're the most important. Uh, and I would help me to understand these conduct complaints because they are called conduct complaints. Can you give me a breakdown of the figure? What do you mean by conduct, staff conduct? Is this a behavioural thing? Is it dis dissatisfaction from a resident aimed at an officer for some reason? Is it internal or is it ex external complaints? And um, what percentage is to in relation to the number of employees we've got? But only the ones that are sort of face to face actually does come into contact with staff because not all folk at council uh, staff comes into contact with members mm -hmm. of the public. And also, I think this is an important thing because we have to sort of go forward. What support and learning strategies have we put in place during this period? So they can improve the contact and what has what has been the outcomes there? Has any staff lost their jobs, etc.? Has there been union involvement in the sense that you know it's been taken to another level and it's it's, it's not actually been acknowledged that there was a staff um contract complaints in actual fact. So thanks. I mean I think that's an excellent question, Councillor Benny, and I, you know you gave it a advanced sight of it, and one of the things I suppose that we identified as we probably aren't good enough at um, recording what's missing behind that. All our complaints are recorded in the customer first system, but at quite high level in terms of um, what it's recording at the moment. So in order to actually get behind the complaints, they would probably need to be looked at individually on a service basis. The other thing that I would say is these are the complaints that we have received. These are not necessarily the complaints that have been upheld. And we don't record that at the moment either, and we probably should. So it may be that we're receiving, you know, for example, I said we received 900 complaints about um, waste collection. That's not the number that were up, upheld. Some of these would have been without foundation, and the same uh, applies to the staff um, uh, complaints. When we talk about con conduct, generally speaking, it tends to be something like, it doesn't tend to be at the level that you're talking about in terms of union involvement or disciplinary, it tends to be interpersonal contact. You know, so for, for example, um, you know, the complainant doesn't like the answer that they've had from the member of, of staff and therefore complains or perhaps doesn't like the tone or um doesn't feel the officer did what they said they were going to do. So it tends to be these sort of complaints rather than things that would lead to disciplinary action. One of the things that we had planned to do earlier this year, but just due to circumstances we didn't do, was to just have a <clears throat> bit of an um, overview and look at what we were recording and see if we could improve what we were recording. We were going to set up a group to do that, but events overtook us. However, we're going we're just about to get that up going again, and that will have officers for all, all small services on it. And I think that the point that you had made, I've already fed back into that group to say, so that's something that we really need to be doing some work on on a cross service basis. Um, and as I say, that group will get going fairly shortly. And the plan is that it meets um, twice a year and um, out with that kind of um, has a Yammer group. So lessons learned and things like that can be shared internally. So we don't have the information that you are requesting at the moment, but we're on the case. Thanks very much, Carolina. Uh, uh, it's very important that staff get support and uh, learning strategies so we can all improve as a council, so we can help the communities. Thank you. David, David Balfour. Thanks, convener. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the contact centre was mentioned. Um, I myself have tried contacting the contact centre through the day and it can take a long time to get through. Um, however, putting it in context, if anybody's ever tried to phone Scottish Power, 
<laughs> then we're doing not too badly. Um, what I will say though is out of hours, uh, when the phone out of hours contact centre, um, you get through quite quickly, and the staff are extremely helpful. Um, so just to just to mention that they've been very very good. Um, so I've got a couple of other questions now. Uh, page thirty three, <clears throat> you've got the, this uh, top ten complaints. We've got other. Um, if we could get a wee bit more info on what kind of things that is. And then the ones below that, um, it's got like council tax account inquiries. Is that actually a complaint or is it just an inquiry? Are they are they all classed as, as complaints as well or? Um, not, not necessarily, it would depend on the nature of them. I don't have the detail of that, uh, Councillor Balfour, but I can certainly go and speak to revenues and benefits and just get a bit more clarity on that for you. And in terms of the other, the, the, as you can imagine, because of the, the number of services that are provided across the council, there's a huge amount of variation in the other. But again, if you want me to have a look and just get some examples of them, um, you know, different types yeah. of things that, we're, that we're recording under that, I can certainly do that. Yeah, it's just to see on the, the list below where it says other, it's just to see if inquiries are actually being classed as complaints there or just a wee bit more clarification on it. Well, there's definition of that in our complaints procedure and I suppose a request for service wouldn't be classed as a complaint, but you know, if somebody had received a service and they weren't happy with it, then that would be classed as a complaint. So that, that's quite defined on, on the complaints procedure. So I can send, send a link out to members just so that you can have a, have a look at that and just see how, how we're interpreting that. Yeah, and that'd be useful. Large, to a large extent, that's not coming from us because that's enshrined in the um, standard complaints procedure produced by the SPSO. It's got a definition of complaints in it. Right. By and large, we try to adhere, adhere to that and that's what staff are working to. But sometimes, as you'll appreciate, it can be quite ambiguous. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, if we can get a wee bit info back then, that link and maybe a wee bit info on some examples of the kind of complaints that are coming in. Can certainly do that. Thanks. <clears throat> it may well be, David, that um, in actual fact, the the, the uh, top ten complaints are being, the the system are being they're being rather hard to themselves. Uh, the complaints. Uh, Department are being uh, rather hard on themselves, and possibly some of the inquiries are are, are just just simple inquiries and not actually complaints. Um, I'm sure they get enough of these without adding to the list. Um, does someone else wish to come yeah, in? Oh yes, right. Yes, Thank you. Convener, sorry, but can I just interrupt before Councillor Spear speaks? The, the way that the standing orders and for these meetings are set up, uh, unfortunately, Councillor Spears and Councillor Bowes, who were on the call, aren't actually able to take part in this discussion. They were allowed to take part on the, the first part, which is performance, but for this part, um, they don't actually have a voice at the committee. So, unfortunately, Councillor Spears can't ask questions at this point. And it's just something I should have said at the end of the item, so apologies for that. Thank you. I'm sure uh, Robert will find some other way of uh, bringing his. Uh, points uh, to the attention of the appropriate officers. Um, can, can I just make one comment um, uh, that it's, I suppose it's a complaint really. Um, the, uh, the, the report, the brochure that's um, copied there at the back, um, if that is in actual fact real size, then uh, we um, ancient people um, are having have considerable difficulty reading it. I, I, I personally gave up trying to read the detail on that. It, it's just, the print is just far too small. Perhaps in actual fact, that's not the real size of the the, the, the document itself. Caroline, can you put me at ease on that one? Or perhaps can you okay. accept the fact that um, the, the, the print is so small, it's almost unreadable to me. I'll, 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 I'll check it. I mean, what we tend to do with it afterwards is we put it on the website, but I'll make sure the print size is increased before it goes on the website to make it more um, legible, because I agree with you, the typeface is pretty small. We do appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a, good, it's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to come in uh, on, on, on the, the, the item? Uh, if not, um, I, I can only um, ask that we note the report. 
as presented and thank Caroline very much uh, for, for uh, the, her contribution and thank all officers indeed for, for the support they've given to the scrutiny committee today uh, and um, thank you all for, for your attendance.